Hello everyone, I am Tanya Laurit and I am a developer advocate at Microsoft. Today I'm going to be presenting as part of the online PyCon 2020 activities our sponsor workshop, which is Easy Data Processing with Python and Azure Functions. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. We're going to be using a number of resources. You can find all the links on this slide. We have a step-by-step -step tutorial that you can follow up at the home anytime, even after this video or whenever you want to revise the materials. There is a GitHub repository that contains all the solutions for the different parts of this tutorial and also this slides that I'm going to be using throughout the presentation. Let's start with serverless computing because all of this workshop is going to be centered around serverless computing uh, or Azure Functions, which is Microsoft Azure serverless offering. The name can be a bit misleading. So a common question that I, uh, that I get asked when I talk about serverless is, are there no servers at all? Does this actually mean that I don't need serverless? There are servers. The only difference is that in this case, you're not responsible for the management or maintenance. That means that you don't need to buy or assemble any hardware or keep it up to date or update the software because all of this is managed and handled by your cloud provider. So your cloud provider in this case is going to be Microsoft Azure, for example, but a lot of other cloud providers have serverless options. This means that by abstracting the whole infrastructure and you not having to take care of the servers or the configuration or the updates, you can focus more on the code rather than on the infrastructure, allowing you to have more efficient and smooth workflows. So why would you want to use serverless? Well, the main advantage is that you already have the managed infrastructure, so that eases the load on the developers and your team. So we can describe this part as managed. It's a managed service, but also serverless can help you to save a lot of money because you only pay for what you use. When you're using a traditional infrastructure, meaning that you have a server in your office or at your home, you're always paying for that server, even when you're not using the compute time in it. So it's running 24 seven. The difference with serverless is that you only pay for what you use or whenever your function or your serverless application is being called or executed. So that can lead in the long term to massive savings in money. And it's also highly scalable. So if you have one user or one customer trying to access your app, and then the next day you have 10,000 customers because your app went viral, um, these applications are very silly to scale because they are on demand and they're also managed. So throughout this tutorial, we're gonna be using Microsoft Azure Functions, which is our serverless platform, as I already man mentioned. It is a managed serverless, meaning that we, can provi we provide all the infrastructure, all the hardware and the software, and it's ready for you to bring your self-contained apps. If you want to learn more about Azure Functions, there is a link at the bottom of this slide that you can visit. So in brief, Microsoft Azure Functions as our managed service handles the software, the monitoring of all your apps, the scaling, whether it's scaling up or scaling down, and the hardware, as well as the host managing. management. That means that your apps can be running in different hosts, and this is handled by Azure Functions as well. In this case, you, as a developer, are only responsible for the application code, making sure that it is correct, that it is adhered to best practices, that you are specifying the correct dependencies and the runtime environment, as well as deciding on the services that you are going to be integrating with your functions, whether it's a database, any sort of storage like blob storage, email, email providers, um, internet services, cloud services, and such. And so far, I've said Azure functions and serverless a lot of times. And you might be wondering why is Microsoft Azure functions called functions or why we call the applications functions? Because serverless computing is also referred to as functions as a service. 
Functions as a service is nothing but self-contained code snippets. And this can be a code snippet or a little app that you have developed for a specific task or a specific purpose. And these are meant to be deployed and executed on the cloud. So these little self-contained code snippets is, are called functions. And that's why Azure Functions is called like that. Some important characteristics of serverless functions are, first of all, they're event triggered, meaning that your function is going to be in an idle state when it, they're not called. That allows you to save money because you're not executing or running a server 24 seven. So you can then decide what kind of event is going to trigger the execution of your function. It can be an HTTP call to a specific endpoint or URL, or maybe you want your function to execute whenever someone drops a file to a certain directory in your storage account, or you want your function to run every Monday at eight o'clock in the morning. The second characteristics of functions is that you can couple services. They're confirmed by a lot of different services that are integrated within a single platform. This contains normally a storage account for the logs and outputs, as well as a runtime environment, compute, um, HTTP services, and many, many others. Something else that is important to notice when you're dealing with serverless architecture is that they're stateless and short-lived. Azure functions, as well as any other serverless functions that you're gonna encounter out in the wild, have usually a time limit. So they're not normally good for very long, long running actions. If you expect your functions to take a very long time to process or to do whatever you're expecting them to do, you might want to look at uh, durable extensions or durable functions. Another thing important is that they're stateless, meaning that if you're creating a resource or an output, they normally disappear when your function start, stops executing. So if there is anything that you want to save, let's say an output can be a plot or a figure or a diagram, you have to couple a storage account where you can send an output to. And finally, serverless functions are also asynchronous, meaning that they would send a request let's say a HTTP request to a URL so that it processes a certain pipeline, but they do not wait for a response. They just execute whenever they receive the trigger. Given these characteristics, there are some particular good use cases for functions as a service. An example of this is image and video processing. I've mentioned before that you can trigger your function so that whenever someone drops a file into your storage account, something happens. A very good example is if you drop an image or a video, maybe you want to do some processing with libraries like Pillow. They're also very good for Internet of Things applications. When you're working with Internet of Things, you usually have a lot of sensors, which means you have a lot of data that, you, that can become quite complex to collate, aggregate, and manipulate. Having asynchronous functions that allow you to deal with this data and process the data is very helpful. And down the same line, they're very good for data pipelines. And this is precisely the scenario that we're gonna be covering in this tutorial. We're gonna be working on a starter pipeline that will show you the advantages and how you can start building your Azure functions for this purpose. So the scenario is, Imagine that you want to collect data from Stack Exchange API. Probably you want to monitor some questions from a specific topic or a tool that you're developing or a tool that your company is working on. Once you collect the data from the API, this needs to be stored for later wrangling and reporting and just general later use. But also because it's easier for you to get an automated report of all of these questions and probably the tags that people are more commonly using with your technology, you also want to get a daily digest in your inbox. For this tutorial, you're gonna have to have Python 
something installed. At the moment, the supported versions for Azure functions is 3.6, 3.7, and 3.8. We're also going to be using VS Code, which is an open source integrated uh, editor, and you can access it and install it from the VS Code marketplace. We're also going to be using the Python VS Code extension as well as the Azure Functions VS Code extension. Installing distance extensions will allow you to make the most of VS Code as well as the Python language and optimize your workflow. And finally, you're going to need a Stack Exchange API app key. All of these requirements as well as all of the detailed instructions for you to follow the tutorial can be found in this tutorial, in this website, aka.ms PyCon 2020 Azure Functions. If you go to set up an installation, it's gonna guide you through how to install all of the requirements and dependencies that you need for this tutorial. Make sure to check it out at your own time. Let's get started. We're gonna, because we want our function to execute every 24 hours or every day, we're gonna be using a timer function or we're gonna be using a schedule function. Let's say that we want a timer trigger, which is nothing but a cron expression to run every day at 9 a.m. When that trigger happens or it is 9 a.m., then that will trigger the execution of your function which will collect data from the Stack Exchange API. Let's get started. If you don't have an Azure account, make sure to visit azuremicrosoft.com to get your new account today. You can get 12 months of free services as well as $200 worth of credit. Don't worry, the link to this is in aka.ms.pycon 2020 Azure functions. We're going to start by creating a directory where we can store all of the files and scripts for our application. I'm going to go to a folder where I normally store demos, but it can be anything else in your computer. We're going to start by creating a folder where we can store all of the scripts and the files for this project. For this, I'm going to use the directive make dir pycon2020 and change into that directory. Because I already have VS Code install, installed in my computer, I can launch it directly from the command line. Because I, locate, I executed VS Code from a directory, it has already created a workspace for me. And this is, a familiar, this is the look that it's going to have when you first open it. This is a sidebar where you can see all of the extensions that you have installed. And this is where we're going to be seeing all of the files that we're going to be working on. You can also launch a terminal using control and backtick in, in Max. We're going to start by clicking on the Azure Functions icon and wait for the extension to launch. You should have a function section like this one before. Make sure that your VS Code is identifying your Python interpreter. The first part will be to log in to Azure. If you've not logged in, when you click here on the, on the extension, you're going to see an icon saying log in to Azure. Once you've done that, you can click on create new project and select the folder that is going to contain it. In this case, it's Python 2020, which is the directory I just made. And I'm going to be using Python language. 
depending on the interpreters that you have installed into your computer, you'll be able to select whichever you prefer to create a virtual environment. In this case, I'm going to choose 3.7. And we're going to start with a timer trigger. I'm going to give my function the name timer function and press enter. If you are not very familiar with, com with Chrome extensions, I've added a link to this Chrome expression descriptor where you write your Chrome extension and then it describes it in layman terms or in plain English. So I'm going to paste that into VS Code and press Enter. Straight away, you're going to see that it starts creating the virtual environment as well as your project. I'm going to select using that virtual environment for this workspace. We can go to the, edit, to the Explorer and you'll notice a series of files that have just been created. Local settings JSON is a file that is going to contain a number of instructions and or a number of keys and variables for you to be able to execute and debug your functions locally. Host JSON contains the version of the Azure functions that you're using as well as any other extensions. There's also a funk ignore file that is very similar to the get ignore. This is to tell Azure functions which files to avoid deploying when you're deploying your functions. And a standard get ignore. You'll notice at the bottom that both the local settings and the app settings.json files are being excluded. This is for you to this is to prevent from you accidentally pushing any any of your secrets or API keys to version control. Now let's inspect the, inspect the function.json file. First of all, it tells you that the script file that is going to contain our Azure function is called dunder init dunder.py. And at the moment we have an, a binding, which is a trigger. It's indicated by the word trigger goes in the direction in and this is the schedule. If it turns out that you want to change the schedule and instead of it running every day at nine o'clock, you want it to run every time, every day at midnight, you can change the schedule here. Now let's inspect the dunder in a dunder pi file. You'll notice that it starts by generating a UTC timestamp. This is because Azure functions by default have a UTC time zone. So make sure to adjust this if you are working or operating in a different time zone. Also, your timer that matches here with what we have, ex what we have in the function JSON file, the name, is declared here as an argument to your main function. And it is of the type timer request. Now that you have a basic function, you should be able to execute locally and debug it directly from VS Code. To do so, we're going to press the function F5 key in your keyboard. You're going to see a new menu appearing on the top bar of your VS Code. Because we're using an Azure function with a timer trigger, we need to create a storage account. I'm going to create a new storage account for this purpose. And I'm going to call it PyCon 2020 demo and press enter. I'm going to create a new resource group as well that is called PyCon 2020 demo. A resource group allows you to have all of your resources and services all together in the same data center. And I'm going to use the central US resource, uh, data center. As when we create a Azure function, you're going to see a display here of the status. This might take a while, so be patient. Once the operation has completed, you're going to see this output for Azure functions. 
it's going to initialize a host as well as initializing all of your function. Since we're using the time triggery, it's going to tell you what is the cron expression that we are using and the next five occurrences of the timer function. So we can see that it's going to be running every day at nine o'clock starting tomorrow. However, we can go to the short functions extension again, expand the local project that is PyCon 2020 and expand the, func expand the functions. If we right click, we can execute the function now. This is going to trigger an execution of your function. And if everything goes all right, you're going to see this output. To stop the local debugger and the local instance, you can click on the disconnect button on the debugging function menu. The next step will be to deploy your first function. You can do it using the Azure Functions extension from VS Code. If you've closed this, click on Azure, ex on Azure extension and then click on the Deploy to, to Function app. We're going to create a new function app in Azure. And I'm going to give it the same name that I've given my resource group. And I'm going to select it. Python 3.7, Central US, and it's going to create my storage account and everything that I need. You can, you can follow the progress of your deployment directly from this status bar. You can expand the output window to see where you are up to as well. Uh, this will deploy information like the Python version, the source directory, and also where your, where your build content is being deployed. You can see the output or the settings as well as the stream logs directly. Now that your function has, now that you've deployed your Azure function, you, we can go to our Azure portal to monitor the function and trigger other executions. If you go to ms.portal.azure.com, it will by default take you to your homepage. There you will be able to see all of the resources that you've created recently, as well as different other navigation quick starts. We're going to click on function app, which is on the left hand sidebar. If this is closed, you can click on this double arrows to expand it. I'm going to click on PyCon 2020 demo. That is the function that I just created. If you see to go, if you go to configuration, you'll be able to see that this already has a certain number of environment variables that the function is going to be accessing. Because we already created an Azure web, web jobs storage, it is already added, so you don't need to create a new key. Let's click here again on Python 2020 demo. And then in function. It will display the Dunder init file that we have at the moment. And similar to how we did it in our local computer, we can trigger an execution of this function. And you will see the status of your request. But if you go to monitoring, you can see when it was executed and the, and the result of that execution or of that call. Note that the first time that you deployed your function and tried to execute it, there might be a bit of a delay, which is called cold start. 
meaning that you have to first initialize a host where your function is going to live and going to be executed from. You can see the status of your function here, meaning that it's running, and you can stop it here as well as, as well if you want. If you go to monitor again, you can see live app metrics. which is going to connect to your app and it's going to provide you a number of refer references or metrics that correspond to the request that you've created, the CPU usage and other, and other stuff. Let's go back to VS Code. At, our, at this moment, our function is not doing anything exciting. So what we want to do is connect to the SAC Exchange API. For this purpose, I'm going to create a new file and a new directory. Inside timer functions, I'm going to create a new folder called utils, where I'm going to put all of my helpers, my helping scripts. Under Hi, file, and also I'm going to create, and I'm also going to create a stack dot, stack dot pi file. In the stack dot pi, I'm going to put all, I'm going to put all the methods that is going to allow me to access the stack overflow or the stack change exchange API. All of this content is in the GitHub repository for this tutorial. I'm also going to modify my main function so that it calls the methods from the util section. Here I am importing my utils methods and I'm also collecting variables. I've also modified my domain function so that it collects the timestamp in an ISO format, collects the variables, create an, creates an object for the stack exchange and collects the questions. Because I need to, because I need to store my stack exchange API keys somewhere, I'm going to also create at the top root of my directory, a .m file. I'm going to create a .m file at the top root of my directory. There I'm going to put the client ID, client secret, and my key for my stack exchange API app. Make sure to replace the values in that function. Make sure to replace the values in that M file. Now that our function has been modified, I also want to make sure that, I, that all my files are identifiable. So I'm going to call this main file, main function, and I'm going to change directly on function JSON the name as well. I'm using python.env to collect environment variable as well as requests. Now we are ready to execute locally. You're going to see that it first is going to install all of the requirements that we added, initialize the host, and display the stages. Once again, we are going to press F5 to debug our functions. And now that we've updated our function files, our requirements, and all of our scripts, we can proceed to execute it. So go again to Assure Extension Functions and click on Execute Function now. And you're going to see that it collected 30 new questions for the search term. If we go back to the scripts, we're going to be able to see that the main function is looking for 
all of the last questions that have Python and Azure functions. But we can change it to anything you want. It can be Python and machine learning. And we're going to redeploy our function. We're going to choose the app that we already created. And we're going to override that app. Once the deployment has completed, I'm going to go back to my Azure portal and go to my functions. Click on timer function, and then I'm going to go to the configuration tab. Here, I will be able to add the keys or the environment variables that I created before. Once you've created your environment variables, you should be able to see them here as well as your Azure Web Storage one. I'm going to click on Save. And update, and I'll notice that my Azure function app is going updated. Again, we can trigger it directly from the portal instead of waiting until the next day at nine o'clock. And we can go to the monitor tab. It can sometimes take a bit of time to make sure that it runs. So far, we've implemented a simple timer function. We have the trigger, we get the function that get executed, and we're collecting the data. I'm going to introduce the concept of triggers and bindings. I mentioned at the beginning of this tutorial that when your function is deployed but it's not in use, it is idle, meaning that it's dormant. Whenever a new trigger appears, in this case it is a cron expression, then your function state changes to active. That is a trigger. As I said, there are many, many different kinds of triggers that you can use. The important thing to remember is that a function can have one and only one type of trigger and only one trigger at a time. Now let's take this scenario where we have our idle function, we have a trigger again. So our function changes to the active state. Sometimes you want to save the outputs of our function. In this case, for the stack exchange data that we're collecting, we want to put that in our Azure blob storage. And that is, that is called a binding. Bindings can have two directions, either output bindings or out bindings or in bindings, meaning the, I, the in is going to be something that our app is consuming. Now that we've checked the concepts of triggers and bindings, we're going to extend the function. We already have the trigger. We have the function and we have the collection part of the pipeline. We're going to now add an out binding so that our CSV file is going is stored in a blob storage. Let's head back to VS Code. I'm going to close these files and I'm going to go back to the Azure Functions extension. If I right click on timer function, you'll see that you can add an external binding. I'm going to select the direction out because we want to send data. Here you can see all the types of bindings that you can choose. I'm going to choose blob storage and I'm going to call this output blob. Now, you want usually your function to monitor only one path within your, your blob. So in this case, I'm going to copy and paste this expression from the tutorial. And I'm going to create a blob container called function blob. 
I want to identify all the files depending on the date and time that it was collected and it's going to have the extension CSV. And I'm going to select Azure Web Job Storage that is already in my local settings. You will see that your function.json file was already, is already been modified. So it has added the, out, the output section of your trigger, of your binding, sorry, as well as the connection. I've also modified the main function so that not only calls so that it only calls the API from Stack Exchange. But also, I'm going to be writing all, this, all the questions to a file and save it as a CSV to the output. We do this by using output blob, which is the same name that I gave to my blob binding. And the way we define these bindings in our main function is we already had a timer in the function time request. But we're going to add the output blob and its type func out bytes because it's going to be taking bytes. And we also want to pass the context for the function. This is very important so that we can see and track the paths where we're going to be saving all of our stuff. And here is our utils functions. Once again, I'm going to press F5 to run locally. Wait for my host to initialize, my function to initialize. And I'm going to trigger it from the Sherry Functions extension. You can see that it was successful. So now we're going to go back to our Sherry portal. and then click on the resource group or we can click on storage accounts. I'm going to click on PyCon 2020 demo. That is a storage account that I use for this function and then in containers. There is a function block container that is the one that I'm using for this function. And you will notice a new CSV file that corresponds to the run that I just triggered locally. Once again, I'm going to disconnect my app or my function and deploy forum VS Code. Once the deployment has been completed, I can go to the Azure portal, go to my functions, and check the runs. Once again, you can trigger your function directly from the portal. And if I look at the storage account and go to my container, the function blob should have a new blob storage. It might take a while to update your function and for the cold start to be resolved. Remember that at any time you can monitor the status of your calls. Fantastic. So now we have created a function that collects data from the Stack Exchange API, processes the data, and then storages in Azure Blob Storage. 
This happens every day at nine o'clock. So we're going to complete the scenario. In this case, because we want this file that has been added to lot of storage to be our trigger, we're going to create a new function that is going to be activated whenever it detects a new function added to this path that we created before. That is function blob slash whatever CSV file is. When this function gets executed, it's going to retrieve the data or the CSV file. Do some manipulation on the data, create some plots. We're mainly interested in identifying which are the tags that have been most commonly used in the last 24 hours, as well as the questions that have and have not got any answers. And we're going to add two bindings. One of the binding is going to send an address to an email address that I have set up. And the other binding is going to save the plot back into Azure Blob Storage. Let's go. Like we did before, we're going to create a new function from the extension. In this case, instead of creating a new project, we're going to create function. And we are going to be using the sure blob storage trigger. I'm going to call it my blob. And I'm going to select a web storage count. Because I want a file from the previous function to be tracked, I'm going to provide the same path. That is function, blob, the placeholder for the name, and CSV. If we go to the if we go back to the editor, you're going to see that we have the timer function and my blob. We only have a set of local settings as well as a host JSON. In the blob, we have again a dunder init file. But instead of having the timer cron expression that we have here before, now the, the parameters are my, my blob and the function is an input stream. For consistency, I am going to rename this so that is blog function. And then I'm going to rename as well this as blob manipulation. I'm going to create a utils folder. Dunder in it. And a processing file. For simplicity, I've copied from the repo some templates because I'm going to be sending an email from with SendGrid. I've also added the templates for a base email using Ginger template. Feel free to use the templates for your own emails. I've also modified the blob manipulation main function. Again, I'm collecting some variables. I've, I'm passing into context and I'm add, adding the methods for sending emails. In the utils file, in the processing script, 
I've also created all the methods to collect the data, extract the data from the Azure Blob storage, render the email template, encode the image that is going to be the plot, create the email, and clean the data. When you have time, you can you can spend some time looking at these methods and what it's doing. It is some very basic manipulation using pandas. I'm not I'm also going to update my requirements file to make sure that all of the libraries that I need are present. Now we're going to create two bindings, one to send the email and then the other one to store the plots into blob storage. Let's start with that one that we're familiar with. So we're going to choose out. I'm going to call it, I'm going to select the blob storage. I'm going to call it apple blob. In this case, I'm going to use this file name. So it is the same path where it, we were saving the CS by files, but in a subdirectory called figures and then assign the same name. The next step is to create a second binding that is going to be the actual email. So I'm going to select for this case, send grid. I'm going to na name it send email. And I'm going to create a new local app setting. Because we need to create an API key so that we can actually send emails using the service. I'm going to call it send grid API key as app string. And I'm going to leave that connection string as private, as well as the to address and the from address. This is how your function JSON file should look like now. Before we're able to debug our function locally, we have to go back to the Azure portal. I'm going to go back to my Azure portal so that I can create a send grid application. I'm going to click on create resource. And in the search bar, click on send grid. Click on create. Because you are already an Azure customer, you're going to get a free plan where you can send 25,000 emails for free. I'm going to choose my subscription, the PyCon 2020 demo resource group. By default, it's going to be the same region. And I'm going to provide all of these details where the name, password, and pricing tier is going to be defined. I am now going to complete the rest of the form. After filling the form, you need to click on create. And then you can go from your resources, from your home page and resources, you should be able to see your SendGrid account. In the top bar, you're going to see a manage button, click there, and it's going to take you to your Send grid dashboard. We need to create an API key. So we're going to go to API keys. You're going to see that I have here one already. So we're going to click on create API. I'm going to give you, give it a name. For example, dummy in this case, I'm going to provide full access. And then click on create and view. Make sure to save your API key because after this, you will not be able to see it. Keep it in a safe place. And we're going to 
uh, two other environment variables, one for receiver and one for sender. In sender, make sure to use the same email that you use to create your SendGrid account. And in receiver, it can be any email account. Also in your local settings, Jason, make sure to add your API key. Keep it private so that other people cannot access it. We've updated our requirements, our scripts, added both bindings, and we should all be ready to execute our function locally. Press F5, you will see again the output, all of the requirements being installed in your local environment. This might take a while. And now if we execute the timer function, we will get the same output that we got before. You will also notice that because we created a new blob storage file, the Python blob trigger function has been processed. If we go back to our Azure portal and then check our blob container, we are ready to deploy our new, our new function. I'm going to go again to my function app, click on Python 2020 demo. Configuration and add a new key. This is going to be my SendGrid API key. Click on Save. Go back to VS Code. I'm going to disconnect the function. And deploy the function directly. I'm going to choose PyCon 2020 demo. And the nice thing about this is that because we already created an Azure Functions project, it's not only going to deploy the timer function or the blob function, but it will deploy all of your local project that is PyCon 2020. Once your function is deployed or when your, once your project has been deployed, you should be able to, be, to see your both functions in here. We can now go to the timer function. And execute it from here. Similar to when we did it on when we did it in our local computer, 
this is going to trigger the blob, the blob manipulation function. We can go to the timer function and run it from here. Similar to when we did locally, this is going to collect the data from the Stack Exchange API, storage and blob, and when that CSV file is added to our Azure blob storage, the blob manipulation function is going to be executed. Email actually leaks. We're using the Jinja templates to render this HTML, this HTML email. We have the plot that we created using Matplotlib of the most popular tags, and we have the list of questions without answers and the questions with answers in a Stack Exchange. We have now completed our scenario. Congratulations! I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Once again, here are the resources, the step-by-step -step tutorial that has a very well-detailed instruction on how to do every step to complete the tutorial, the GitHub repository with all the sample code for the solutions, and the slides. See you all soon and hope you enjoyed PyCon 2020 this year online.